Okay, now we're to the point where we have data in Refine and we can actually start to have fun. This is where the exploration begins. Town said that he, when he looked at Alex's data, he basically wanted to explore and see what was in there, get an idea of what the data set, what the parameters of the data set were, what it looked like. So that's the kind of thing that we're going to do now and in the process get to learn some of the basics of how Refine works. So, so far I've only talked about what's above here in the white part, exporting data. Now we get into the actual data. Here we're given a list of how many rows there were loaded into the, from the data set. That number will change as we begin to manipulate the data. And I'll show you that. We're showing all of the rows in the original data set. There are times where the data have structure, where there's actually more than one item in a record, but we're not looking at data like that. This you would use for looking at data in a format such as XML or JSON. But we're looking at a text file where one row is one record, so we're looking at rows. This allows you to show how many records you want to see on the screen at one time. And over here is sort of a navigation bar. You can move through all the data set over here. Now, <coughs> what we have below are a bunch of different columns with the file headers and each column has its own little menu. There's one menu for the first two. These, these, sorry, the first three. These three columns are columns that Refine uses and that you can use. The, first, the third one is just a sequential number of the record. These are not data, it's just first row, second row, third row. These two allow you to mark records either with a star or with a flag. And the meaning of the star and the flag can be whatever you want them to be. For example, you could use the flag to say this record has a problem that I need to come back to. You've looked at it and you say, that one's a problem. The star could mean, I've looked at this and it's completely clean. So it's a way to distinguish what, where you are in the process of data cleaning. We won't use those right now, at least, maybe later. What we really want to do is get into actually starting to look at the contents of the data and to manipulate them. We do that by looking at one of these menus. So I'm going to pick prefix. Every one of them has this same menu. It has a menu for facets, filters, editing cells, editing columns, transposing, sorting, viewing, and reconciling. Some of these look like Excel. Other ones you probably have no idea what they are. Hopefully you will by the time we're finished. A facet is a way to constrain the data. As we're looking at part of the data. It's a view, let's say. So let's look at that one to begin with. There apparently are plenty of different kinds of facets. There are text facets, numeric facets, timeline facets, scatterplot facets, and some customized ones as well. So if I choose any of the basic ones above, what it will do is give me in my workspace over here a way to look at and to choose parts of the data from over here. So let me choose a text facet right now. And now over on the right what has happened is it has looked at the prefix field. And now it's giving me a summary. There are 148 different values in the prefix field. Right now they're being sorted by the name. We could also sort by how many of them there are. So the name is the part here, that's the value in the field, and the count is the number afterwards. So there are 11 that begin with A and maybe a space after, I don't know. I can't tell here the distinction between those two. 
and 21 that begin with A, 4 with SL. So that's a summary. The facet allows me to manipulate based on the values of the prefix field in this case. So, for example, if I hover over the row for the value A, I can include only those values on this side. So let me click on it. And now I'm looking at only 21 rows. Remember there were 21 that matched. So I'm looking at 21 rows out of the 65,534. And now something occurs to me. This is a funny number. And now I have to go and ask Alex something. That number looks suspiciously like the number of records that will fit in an Excel spreadsheet. I'm guessing that Alex has not given us all his data. Maybe not by intent, but by the format of the file. It was an old style Excel spreadsheet. And it's probably incomplete. So this is where I ask Alex, how many records are really supposed to be in your database? Uh, this may be correct, but I suspect that it's not. I suspect he has more records than that. Backing up. Now I'm looking at the 21 rows that begin with the letter A. And now I can manipulate or do anything I want with just those records. So this is an easy way to get the list of distinct values and to look at subsets of them. So right now I've included only the A, but I now have the option also to exclude it. So now I'm looking at everything that is not A. Sorry, I, I just undid what I did before. I'm looking at all of it. I excluded that filter. I can include it again. What I wanted to do instead was to invert. So just to tell you again what I did, clicking on exclude says, okay, let's not filter on A. That's why we saw everything again. What I wanted to show you was invert, which means show me everything except A. So now you can see that there are 21 rows missing from the total. It's the 21 that had A, and you can see here that it has a line through it that says, nope, there are no A's in there. And I can reset that. Those are the basics of a text facet. And it's a way to look at parts of the data, and especially to get an idea of what's in that field. So we can look at a more interesting field, let me remove this facet. And I'm looking at all the data. And I'm sort of interested in the range of years in Alex's data set. So now I have an option. I can look at the years as text. I'll do that. Why not? And now I can see from the list that there are 191 different years in that field. <laughs> Alex's collection has been going for a really long time. In fact, longer than I thought. It's, go it's been going since the 11th century. This is a nice old collection. And there are quite a number of old specimens, all the way before 1656. So there's a problem in the year field with some number of records. I don't e know easily what number of records have that problem, so let me try something else to figure that out. Let me try the year using a number facet, a numeric facet. So this is going to treat the field as numbers instead. Now I have a completely different view over here. It's a slider bar of numbers. And it tells me that the lowest value is zero, and the highest value is 3,000. So he's anticipating well into the future as well. It's quite a broad collection. 
So I'm curious about the things that are after today's year. So I'll go up to the year 2000, let's say. And another thing I can do is to sort that column. I'd like to sort it as numbers, and I'd like the largest one first. Okay, I see what's happening. It's just the wrong number in the first location for two records. And those two records are making a problem for me. So if I know those really are from 1965 and 1956 respectively, I can change them right here and be done with that problem. I'm guessing right now, but yes, due diligence would suggest you go find out what the real value is. Now, I didn't actually apply it. You noticed that, and you were telling me so. Thank you. I was too quick about it. Here I've changed the value, and I want to apply it. If I apply it, it does it only in that cell, but if I have many other cells in the database with the same value, I can change all of them at once. Because I sorted, and the biggest one is first, I know there are no more 2,956s after that. I can apply, or if I wanted, I could apply it to all. So it's no longer on that list. Why? Because now it doesn't fit the criteria that I set. Now it goes back on that side where it belongs. So as I make fixes here, I'm going to reduce the problems that are in my view. Let me fix the other one. Apply that to all. Okay, so now I'm, my biggest year is 2009. And let me redo, just because it's the easiest way, my numeric facet and see how things look now. Seems I still have some large numbers. Oh, wait, let me do something else. This is telling me something about the values in the fields. It tells me how many are actually numeric, how many cannot be construed as a number, how many are blank, and how many are errors. So, there are actually two interesting records, the ones that are non-numeric. I should have a look at those. Interesting. Those are the two that I just created. Why is that? It's because the last time I opened... No, it's, that's not why. Hold on, let me think a moment. Somehow, these are text fields and not numeric fields. That's why. Because when I edited it, I looked here and I applied to all identical fields, but I was not careful about what type it was. So now, I can go back and I can fix that and say it should be a number. Now it's not on this list anymore. And I can do it with a 1956 as well. Come on. Good. Okay. Let me try again. Year field, numeric facet. <coughs> okay. <coughs> 